In this video, I discuss 10 mistakes to avoid if you're planning on retiring early. Coming up next on Holy Schmidt. Holy Schmidt! Retiring early is the great American dream. It's something we think about the first day we come home from working a real job and realize it's not like living with mom and dad anymore. Over time, some people obsess over it, committing to become part of the FIRE movement, financially independent retire early. But for most of us, retiring early means getting out of the workforce in our late 50s or early 60s, not at 65 plus. All right, let's get into it. But before we do, please make sure you click the like button. YouTube uses the number of likes in a video to determine its place in the search results. And I want to help as many people as possible. Point one, financial readiness. Have you saved enough? The question is a bit like how long is a piece of string? Some people feel like they need to have a tremendous amount of money available to account for every possible scenario. Others are a little bit more practical and they'd like to cover what they think are the most likely outcomes. As they get comfortable with the different scenarios, there are a few questions they ask themselves to make sure that they're calibrated correctly. The first is how variable is your spending? At least how variable will your spending be in the future? The answer to this question is supremely important because if you know the answer to this, you'll be able to predict with a reasonable level of specificity what your spending will look like in one, two, three, five, even 10 years out and more. Some get it within 5%. Others can't get it within 50%. A lot of it depends on how they've arranged their lives. But there are some indicators that determine if you're closer or further away. The major one, the one that most people think about is, do you have your major expenses taken care of? Is your mortgage paid off? Are your credit cards paid off? If you have college to pay for for your children, is that funded? Do you have a wedding you need to pay for? You get the point. If you don't know the answer to these big expenses, make sure you write them down, understand what they are and how you're going to pay for them. Next, understand healthcare costs. By the way, this is the one that most people pretend doesn't exist because frankly, they're blind to it. Their employer paid for their healthcare almost their entire working lives. And so when it's time to go out of the workforce, this is one that catches a lot of people off guard. Healthcare can be very, very expensive. If you don't have a plan in place with a reasonable premium that covers all of your major medical costs, this is something that could damage you in retirement. Where you go for health insurance if you retire early comes down to maybe four or five different choices. If you're one of the lucky few that has an agreement with your employer because of a pension benefit where they will also cover your health insurance, that's fantastic. If this isn't you, you have a few choices. The first is to stay on your employer's plan utilizing COBRA benefits. In other words, you pay for the entire cost of your health insurance yourself. And that can be very expensive, particularly on a company plan. If your spouse is still working, going on his or her plan is always an excellent option and probably one of the least expensive options under most scenarios. If that's not available to you, going into the healthcare marketplace, depending on your state, might be a good place to check out health insurance at a reasonable price. And if all else fails, an individual plan may be the way to go. But to be super clear, you do need health insurance. If you're going to retire early, you can't go without it because all of those years you worked planning to get out of the workforce early can be wiped out with one big medical expense. Next, you need a sensible withdrawal strategy from your retirement accounts. Don't rely on gut or intuition here. You need a plan and you need some sort of analytics around this to make it work for you. Because if you rely on gut, you could overshoot the mark and spend down your retirement savings much more quickly than you anticipated. This will leave you vulnerable at the very point in your life where you need that retirement money the most. There are a lot of places you can go that will help you come up with the right number. A financial planner is an excellent place, one that has your best interest at heart. They're called a fiduciary. A fiduciary financial planner is obligated to do the best for you in terms of their decision making. They don't work for themselves outside of the fee that they get paid. If you don't use a financial planner, there are online calculators that will help you with this and rules like the 4% rule, which come in handy, but should not be used in isolation. They should be used as part of an overall strategy when you're thinking about how much you can spend down. If you are doing it yourself, please make sure that you use a realistic rate of return, 
Some people vary the rate of return to come up with a number rather than coming up with a number based on a rate of return. The problem with this strategy, of course, is that equity markets can be quite volatile. And there were a number of years where the equity markets were essentially flat. Next, know your post-retirement lifestyle expectations. When we were in our 20s and 30s, we envisioned retirement something like this. We would have a yacht. We would take that yacht out and go fishing for the afternoon, come back, have a barbecue, followed by a big party at the beach house where friends and family would come over two or three nights a week. As we get older, we realize that some of these aspirations don't make a lot of sense, and the yacht is replaced by a boat on a lake, and the beach house is replaced with a cabin in the woods. The important thing to note here is what are your expectations for your retirement lifestyle and to get very granular about this so that you don't come up short. And remember the golden rule. When you go into retirement, you need to spend on health and safety first and luxury last. I can't tell you how many people I know personally who made a lot of money during their working years and came up short when they retired. They spent it all. This is a blind spot for many people because they assume that they're going to continue to be able to spend like they did when they were working, and that's just not realistic for most people. That is unless, of course, they had an ultra high paying job like a hedge fund manager or they invested incredibly well. Safety, by the way, means having a comfortable home in a safe area with access to good medical care and a lot of friends. The other point to note here is that when you retire, you'll go from having no time to an abundance of time and you need to figure out what to do with that time. If you don't plan your days with inexpensive or free activities, there's also a good chance you'll spend a lot of money trying to fill that gap. The next thing you need to know is the effect of inflation on your investment portfolio. If you were fully invested in the S&P 500 five years ago, your portfolio would be up 85% today. However, during that same period of time, inflation increased prices by 20%. So if you needed 50,000 per year to retire five years ago, you now need 60,000 per year today. Some areas experience much greater inflation, like some of the big city centers and on the coasts of the United States. So you do need to consider the effect of inflation on your portfolio, because even if your portfolio has gone up, your costs have gone up too. More importantly, inflation as a measure is probably understated for many of you because the consumer price index, which is the numbers that this data is based on assumes that you'll substitute out of one type of product for another if you find it too expensive. For example, if you normally purchased filet mignon and you could substitute out that for sirloin steak, the CPI would choose the difference between the two, not the change in price in filet mignon. The next thing you really need to know about is longevity risk because most people think that they're going to pass away at a certain point in time, and the math might suggest an accurate picture, but then again, it might not. The fact is people are living longer. One of my grandmothers told me that she was sure she wasn't gonna live past age 65, and she lived well into her 70s. The other was a centenarian. At the time, one out of 5,000 people achieved the centenarian status, in 2054, the projected number is going to be one out of a thousand, so five times more likely to live to age 100. What does this mean for you? Well, you never know, of course, unfortunately, but you could live a lot longer than you think you're going to, simply because medical technology has created a really good environment for your health, but it's also a really bad environment for your finances. The next thing you need to know is that markets are volatile. Most of us have only experienced a surging S&P 500 index. It's been basically having a bull run for the better part of the last 40 years. But you only need to think about the time when you were a child, the period between 1972 to 1982 roughly, the markets were effectively flat and inflation was raging. Could we be in a situation where inflation continues up over the next decade or so and markets are flat? Well, you tell me. So what do you need to think about? Well, first, money managers probably can't bail you out of this situation because frankly, nine out of 10 of them, I think that's the statistic now, nine out of 10 of them can't outperform the S&P 500. But if you're in a situation where you have a few good years of performance, don't get the spendies, don't spend that down, redeploy that capital back into your investments so that you can fortify your position. 
The next thing you need to get right is debt management. Let me explain. 60% of retirees at age 65 have debt. The number drops down slightly to 50% when the retiree on average is age 70. Debt is the biggest lifestyle crusher out there and frankly it forces people to make decisions about how to spend their money that they wouldn't have to make. They could make better choices for themselves if they could reduce or eliminate debt. The point is, if you're going to retire early, or not even, you need to get your debt down and keep it down to have the best retirement. Next is timing your social security appropriately. The fact is most people, when they take social security, they take it basically on or around when they retire. That's not always the case, but largely that's the case. If you can wait to take social security beyond age 62, the SSA will increase your payment by about 6% per year for every year up to your full retirement age. Beyond full retirement age, it's more like 8% per year up to age 70 for the primary insured. And just to tackle this point head on, some people have made the decision that they're going to take Social Security at age 62 and invest it. Here's the problem with that strategy. So I want to make sure you go in with your eyes wide open. If you plan on continuing to work, the maximum you can earn is $22,320. Anything beyond that, you have to give back $1 for every $2 over that amount. If you're not retiring early, that means that you're probably thinking about living off of your investments in most cases. Putting a pension aside, that's a completely different animal, but assuming that you're not talking about having a pension, you're talking about living off of your 401k and other investments. So you're going to be adding to your investments only to turn around and utilize your investments. So in essence, you're taking your social security and you're spending it. Overlay the fact that you are taking on additional risk in most cases anyway, when you're investing money because there isn't really much in the way of a risk-free investment outside of US treasuries. And even there, one could argue that they're not entirely risk-free because if you plan on selling them at any point before maturity, well, you take market risk on what the interest rate environment looks like at the time. And speaking of time, the next thing to consider is how will you spend your time? You need to plan for that because you're going to have a lot of it. For the average retiree, they work eight to 10 hours per day, plus commute time. Often that comes to 10 hours plus of time they now have unplanned during their day. If they don't plan on what to do with that time, one way to fill it is to go spend money on things. Other that, or people tend to sit around and not do much, in that instance, they get bored, they get depressed, and they find that they wish they were back at work. So you need to have a plan on how you're going to spend your time, because if you don't, it could be a money pit. Gang, there's a lot going on in the world today, and there could very well be a lot of changes in the next six to 12 months on things like social security, rules around 401ks, IRAs, the Roth. And so make sure you click subscribe and turn on notifications so that you get alerted the next time I post a video. Right now I'm posting about twice a week. Also, if you'd like to see another side of me, you can visit me on Instagram. My handle, I believe that's what it's called, is the underscore Schmidt list. There you'll see quick sound bites and motivational sayings amongst other things. If you like this video, check out that video. Retirees spend 80% of their income in these five areas. This is Jeff Schmidt. Thanks for watching.